One, major three, four, minor four, one. This is a chord progression that comes up in popular music from time to time. There are lots of well-known songs that use it. To name a handful, there's Creep by Radiohead, the chorus of David Bowie's Space Oddity, I Kissed Someone, It Wasn't You by Doty, the theme song from the Cartoon Network show Steven Universe, Get Free by Lana Del Rey. In fact, a few years ago, Radiohead's publisher sued Lana Del Rey over that song, wanting 100% of its royalties, claiming it was totally lifted from Creep. I'm not sure what happened with that lawsuit, but it appears to have reached a settlement, and the writing credits for Get Free have not been updated to include Radiohead, so maybe they just dropped the whole thing? Admittedly, the two songs do sound quite similar on the surface, not just in the chord progressions, but in the timbres and textures used, as well as the targeted notes in the vocal melody. Maybe in another video I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison just for kicks, but what I really want to talk about is this chord progression. When you search this chord progression, Music Theory Reddit can't seem to agree on how to even label the chords. I'll admit, it is a bit of a head-scratcher. In the case of the Radiohead song, the chords are G, B, C, C minor. A lot of people look at this and have trouble figuring out what key it's even in. It's got a G and a B chord in it. Those two chords don't even come from the same key. And it has both C major and C minor. Clearly there's some chromatic stuff going on here that takes a bit more thought to puzzle out, but anyone can hear that these chords work together. There's a handful of ways you could break down why this chord progression works. So let's operate on the assumption that this is in the key of G. And actually that's not an assumption, it is in the key of G. You start on a G chord and the C minor resolves back to G pretty strongly. It's in G. Analyzing these chords in G, we only have two diatonic chords. G is the one chord, and C is the four chord. Nothing unusual about those. The big question marks go over the B major and C minor. Those don't live in the key of G. Let's look at the B major first. Whenever you have a major chord appear in a key where that specific major chord doesn't belong, you have to assume it's some kind of secondary dominant. That essentially means you're borrowing the five chord from another key to tonicize a chord in the key you're actually in. In other words, to make a chord other than the one chord sound like the one chord, at least temporarily. So the question is in what key is B the five, either E major or E minor? E minor is the sixth chord in G, so when we hear B major, the expectation is that it will resolve to E minor like this. Except it doesn't. It goes to C. So can we still call it a five of six then, if it doesn't go to the sixth chord? Maybe, you could say it's a five of six that deceptively resolves to the four chord. I'd buy it, I think that's functionally what's happening here. Nevertheless, the voice leading makes sense almost any way you look at it. From the G chord to the B chord, the note G steps down to F sharp, the fifth of B major, the B stays right where it is, going from acting as the third of G major to the root, of B major, and the D steps up to D sharp, the third of B major. Two voices move by a half step, and one stays right where it is, making a common tone connection between the two chords. That common tone connection makes the change pretty seamless. And then going from B to C, every note just goes up by a half step in strict parallel motion. It's like the B chord is just leading tones to the notes of C major. Even if you voice them differently like this, maybe, where B goes down a third to G, D sharp goes down to C, and F sharp goes down to E. It still sounds pretty well connected, even though the D sharp to C is a weird leap of an augmented second. This way might not be considered good voice leading, but it still sounds pretty decent. Regardless, I tend to think of this as a secondary dominant resolving deceptively. If you remember my video from a few weeks ago on the backdoor 2-5-1 progression, it's kind of the same thing. You can resolve a dominant 7th chord a scale degree up for a colorful, unexpected resolution. If this B was a B7, it would still produce this mysterious, unexpected result if it went to C. Even though we're operating with a B major triad instead of a full dominant seventh chord, it still functions the same way. So how do you label the chord? I tend to call it a major three, but you could call it a five of six as well. Now, 
let's look at the C minor. This one is a little less complicated. A minor four chord in a major key is a pretty common thing in Western popular music. There's a lot of ways you can explain why it works, but it just boils down to the voice leading like anything else. To get to C minor from C major, all you have to do is lower the third by a half step. So E becomes E flat. So now we've got an E flat floating in our space here. In the key of G, E flat is the lowered sixth scale degree. Generally, any non-diatonic note you label as flat wants to resolve down a half step, just like any non-diatonic note you label as sharp wants to resolve up a half step. So here, E flat is pulling down to D, and it goes there when we cycle back to G. D is the fifth of G major. It's a pretty simple thing. I think of minor four chords as a sort of dominant substitution, or a substitution for the five chord. This C minor could very well have been a D major, the five chord in G. But that's just the wrong flavor for this song. It's too bright and optimistic. A minor four going to the one is much darker and somber sounding. It's just got a lot more sorrow and angst in it, you know? And it has a similar gravitational pull to the one chord as the five chord. So there you go. That's how this progression works on a structural level. What do you label the chords? Well, the labels don't really matter. I usually call it a one, three major, four, four minor. That gets the point across well enough, and it makes it pretty easy to figure out what chords you're supposed to play. We can argue about labels and terminology all day long, but what matters is understanding and hearing the internal logic behind why a somewhat unorthodox chord progression like this works. So I hope you found this video useful. I post a new lesson video like this every Thursday. I currently have some openings for new private Zoom students. If you'd like more information about that, feel free to reach out to me. That's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next week.